and Politics with Derek Goldman. And before I give a brief introduction to our next panel, I just want to add my own thanks to the simply phenomenal Jojo Roof, who's done such an incredible job. I know all of you want to hire her, and that is not allowed. That is like the rudest thing you could even think of. So don't even, don't even ask. <clears throat> You know, I come, I'm sort of like Dean Hillman, a little bit on the politics side of a performance and politics. I come to this from having experienced as a diplomat uh, when I had the privilege of being the U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands, having experienced the importance of d uh, culture in international affairs and diplomacy, and also having experienced how the State Department doesn't take that very seriously seriously or do much at all with culture. I figured I probably couldn't take on the whole State Department, but what I could do was try to change the people going into the State Department, uh, namely Georgetown students. And luckily, now I'm able to do that together uh, with Derek. And w why is that important? Why do I say that culture really needs to be taken more seriously as a part of diplomacy? Normally, I'm giving the spiel to diplomats and foreign service people saying, please take culture seriously. Now with you guys, I'm saying, please take foreign policy seriously. Um, and the two of you really need each other. Why? Well, let's take, for example, one of the greatest problems facing the world today, countering violent extremism. This is a cultural problem. This is a problem of narratives. This is not a problem to be fought or won, at least. Uh, with bombs and drones or, you know, even hashtags from the State Department, which is an actual real strategy, if you can believe it. But this is a, a problem to be approached, a long-term problem, with many facets, but one approach that all of you and we together have some control and ownership over, it's a problem to be approached by listening to authentic local voices, as we've been doing all day today, leveraging those local voices and finding ways to help them be effective with their own communities and ourselves learning from them. That's the only way that we can begin to approach these problems. I'm really talking about a human-centered approach to diplomacy. And when I say that, to me, that sounds like evidence-based medicine. I mean, what other kind would you do? Uh, but, uh, but, you know, human-oriented diplomacy, that is not what we do. And, and I'm going to end by giving you an example. If you all were Georgetown freshmen going into your first international relations class. In that first class, you would learn about the Melian Dialogues. And this is essentially the justification for the strong, the Athenians, to massacre the weak, the Melians, who they'd already conquered. Uh, the Melians asked for mercy, and the Athenians say, no, nah, I don't trust you. I'm going to kill you. And, um, and that's taught, and the rest of the story actually goes on. The Athenians eventually pay for that, but they don't study that. They study the massacre of the Melians, which is presented uh, as a justification for realpolitik. You know, sometime, even if you're as great as the Athenians, you just have to suck it up and massacre people. Uh, and, well, we're, we're pretty much doing real politique. And uh, how's that working out for us? Now, another approach, instead of reading the Melian Dialogues, what if they read Euripides, the Trojan women? And we'll hear from one of our amazing refugee actresses in Syria, the Trojan women. What if they read about history from the victim's perspective, from the human perspective? What if that were the starting point, which would create a sense of empathy rather than a sense of privilege and domination? 
you all have the incredible capacity to change that Melian dialogues narrative <laughs> to a more human-centered one. Uh, and I really hope that this can be the beginning of real interdisciplinary continuation. Many of you do it already. More <laughs> interdisciplinary cross-cultural collaboration, because we really need it. Now, I'm very happy to introduce our next panel, History and Home. We're going to have three amazing playwrights here to talk about how their cultural, national, and personal histories engage with the present tense. And Catherine Corre will moderate the panel. She's the program director for the Lark Middle East U.S. Playwright Exchange and a faculty member at NYU Tisch and also NYU Abu Dhabi. That's Thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thanks for hanging in. It's a long day, but it's a great day. I have learned so much already. I, I can't believe it. Um, I'd like to introduce the wonderful people that I'm here to uh, speak with, uh, starting with, uh, on my far left, uh, Fabio Rubiano who was a playwright, director, and actor from Bogota, Colombia, and founder of Teatro Petra, which he co-founded with Marcela Valencia in 1985. Fabio has written and directed over 20 plays, of which four have received Colombia's National Playwriting Prize. He has received numerous grants to create new works, as well as playwriting residencies abroad in Spain and Mexico. He received the Premio Nacional de Dirección Teatral in 2013. In 1994, his, re his work was recognized with the Theater Award from UNESCO. His plays have been produced in Chile, United States, Spain, France, Mexico, Peru, and Slovenia. His work has been translated to English, French, Portuguese, Bosnian, Chinese, and Slovenian, and has toured festivals in Europe, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the United States. Welcome, Fabio. Um, next, Kyung Park, who was born in Santiago, Chile, and is the first Korean playwright from Latin America to be produced and published in the United States. He is the author of a number of plays, including Tala, which was produced by Kyung's company, Pacific Beat Collective at Here Arts Center, and a short play called Mina, which was included in seven contemporary plays from the Korean diaspora, published by Duke University Press. Among many associations, Kyung is a member of the Mai Yi Writers Lab, is a New York Theater Workshop usual suspect, and is an alum of the Ensemble Studio Theater's, Studio Theater's Young Blood. He has enjoyed playwriting residencies at Centro Cultural Gabriela Mistral in Chile, the Royal Court Theater in London, and has been awarded a TCG Global Connections Grant, a Princess Grace Foundation Special Projects Grant, and was named a 2010 UNESCO Ashberg Laureate. Heather Raffo, on my near left, is a solo performer and writer of the off-Broadway hit Nine Parts of Desire, which details the lives of nine Iraqi women. For her creation and performance of Nine Parts and its national and international tour, Heather garnered many awards, many, <laughs> including a Lucille Lortel Award and the prestigious Susan Smith Blackburn and Marion Seldes Garson Kanan Playwriting Awards, as well as Helen Hayes Outer Critics Circle and Drama League nominations for Outstanding Performance. Her current project, Fallujah, the first opera on the Iraq War, with libretto written by Heather and music by Tobin Stokes, was featured at the Kennedy Center's International Theater Festival in 2014 and premiered, uh, was premiered by Long Beach Opera at the National Guard Armory in Long Beach. I want to hear about that. And it will premiere at New York City Opera in November 2016. Heather enjoys an ongoing residency in the Department of Performing Arts at Georgetown University. She has taught and performed at dozens of universities and art centers, both in the United States and internationally, engaging students about the politics and arts of Iraq and about her own experiences as an Iraqi-American playwright and actress. Welcome to you all. So history and home. And I wanted to start with everybody by asking you very directly about something that you are currently working on that um, perhaps addresses um, uh, uh, this particular topic. What 
the project that you worked on or are working on um, means to you in terms of uh, history and home. Um, and keeping in mind a few ideas that I have been mulling over and also uh, came out of a wonderful conversation I had with Teresa Eyring yesterday, um, that has to do with the balance between social responsibility and artistic responsibility in your work. Something I think that you've all been addressing very carefully, and I really want to hear about that. Um, but I want to give you some rain in um, describing to us uh, what your experience of each of these projects has been. And I particularly want to start with Fabio and uh, ask about Labio de Liebre which is a production that was commissioned by Teatro Colón, correct? Co-production. A co-production with? Teatro Petra, our uh -huh, group. With your theater, come, perfect. Um, which, from what I understand, uh, focuses on uh, a man who was responsible for the murders of many Colombians, in which those people appear to him as ghosts, is it? <laughs> yeah. Kind of? <laughs> moment. Okay. Talk yeah, yeah. to us. Tell yeah, yeah. us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, bueno, hablo en español para no someterlos a mi inglés. Um, <coughs> el, uh, siempre está la discusión. No, nuestras obras son como nuestro país, que son ambiguas, controversiales, contradictorias. Mm. Así. Mm -hmm. lo que está. Yeah. Um, he said he's going to speak in Spanish, so he doesn't submit you to his English. <laughs> but I, um, he said that in Colombia, our contemporary plays are always ambiguous, con contradictory, and really are about um, evidence of our national character. And uh, in the caso específico del labio de liebre, um, es una pieza, digamos que para algunos, para muchos. Es una pieza con un alto contenido político eh, y sin embargo ha tenido lo que se podría llamar, un, ha sido lo que se podría llamar un éxito comercial, lo cual es extrañísimo en, en nuestro país y para nosotros, para nuestros 31 años de carrera nunca nos había pasado. So, Labio del Liebre, ¿puedes eh, eh, explicar un poco del título específico? Uh, vale, okay. okay. Um, which he's going to explain where the title comes from. Um, it's highly political. It really is um, an intense look at the duality of the government, the duplicity of the government in Colombia, and how it, it affects uh, the people. Um, and it's not a, a typical manifestation of theater in Colombia. At the same time, it's been an, an unbelievable commercial hit, which is, has never happened to the theater, which he has headed for 31 years. And so it's an extraordinary <laughs> contradiction in and of itself. El, um, la pieza habla de alguien que ha estado en un proceso de paz, que se acogió a un proceso de paz, que ha cometido muchos crímenes en el pasado y está cumpliendo una condena. Eh, lejos de su país, una especie de destierro. Eh, como se habla que nuestro país es el más feliz del mundo, a pesar de las masacres, las violaciones, el desplazamiento, se dice que es el país más feliz del mundo. La pena es estar lejos del país más feliz del mundo, sí. lejos del trópico, en un país donde siempre cae nieve. Ok, so, um the story is about a man who, under the process of the peacemaking process that uh, Colombia has engaged in over the last couple of years, um, is sentenced to live outside of the country uh, because of the atrocities that he committed. Um, he has been sentenced to live in exile. Um, and it's uh, ironic that Colombia, they call their country the happiest place in the world, even though there have been massacres and rapes and killings. Um, they still, because of the tropical nature of the country, they still think of, the, of Colombia as the happiest place in the world. Ergo, being exiled from the happiest place in the world is the worst sentencing you can get. Uh, and the people say it. This is the best country of the world. 
This is the best. Every time say that. Eh, el, el hombre está en su casa, en el exilio, cumpliendo su condena y de pronto en su casa le golpean. Y entra una persona muy extraña para esta ciudad, para este país. Y es una persona que, que parece como un campesino. Y después en, otro sale del baño, luego otro sale de la nevera, otro aparece en su cama y nos damos cuenta que es gente a la cual él le hizo daño en el pasado, muchísimo daño. Y vienen a pedirle una cosa. Pero... <laughs> so he is in this foreign land, a, a snowy kind of environment, and all of a sudden he hears a knock on the door. And in comes um, this strangely dressed woman who obviously is a peasant woman. Um, she's dressed in pre pre little peasant garb, uh, and all of a sudden somebody springs out of the um, ice box and somebody comes out of the bathroom and somebody is in his bed, and all of a sudden you understand that these are people from his past who he has hurt, who he has mm. hurt very deeply. Mm. Uh, 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 <laughs> and the character called La Vio de Liebre, Hail Sleep, uh, Hair slip, do hair you lip, hair, hair lip. Hair lip? Hair lip, yeah. Lie uh, uh, the title of the piece, Labio de Liebre, is a hair lip in Spanish. Hair lip. The characters say to the, to the man, look at me. You killed me when I was a child. Do you remember? Ah, ahí empieza la obra. And, and there's where the play starts. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a co-production with Teatro Colón, and that is a very um, uh, prestigious theater, correct? It's a state theater. A state theater. It's a theater, but it's del Estado, no? It's a theater del Estado. And so, did it represent any kind of a risk for them to produce a play of this content? When the director of the theater saw the first ensayo general of the obra, he said, "Me van a echar." So um, she, so, <laughs> so she um, obviously wanted to know what the political implications were, and she said, he said, when the director of the National Theater, this is the National Theater of Colombia, saw the first rehearsal, he said, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> Pero prefiero que me echen y no que le cambien alguna cosa a la obra. But I prefer to be fired than you change anything in the play. Oh. Mm. Sí. It's, a, it's an extreme case. You should meet the guy from Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We need those leaders. So, um, what was the response of the audience? Um, it's controversial. Eh? <laughs> well, uh, our responsibility. Uh -huh. uh, what? What ¿Qué, do qué, qué no, no, no. Uh, ¿Cuál fue el, ¿Cómo se uh, portó el, el público? ¿Cuál fue la ah, reacción Ah, yo me sé la responsabilidad. Sí. Ah. The response. Ah. The response. My English. Eh, el, 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 todas las funciones han estado agotadas. Todas. En las temporadas, en las funciones que tenemos fuera de la ciudad... Todas han estado agotadas y la gente sale muy, muy cargada con, con sentimientos contradictorios. Hay mucha gente que llora, hay mucha gente que sale con mucha rabia y durante la obra, paradójicamente, a pesar de que hablamos de cosas terribles, la gente se ríe mucho. So, the reaction, um, first of all, it's been sold out for every single showing, uh, as well as the national tour that they've done. Um, and, and the public reacts um, in very many different ways. Some of them come out crying, some of them come out very angry, uh, but it really provokes intense emotions in the people who see the piece. Hmm. ¿Por qué se ríen? Eh, pongo un ejemplo de la vida real que aparece en una parte de la obra. Hace poco salió de la cárcel un líder paramilitar uh, al que se le acusaba 
de que habían cortado cabezas y habían jugado fútbol con ella, fútbol soccer. So, um, there's also places in the piece that there's nervous laughter. And so why are people laughter? He's giving a, a particular example. There's, there's um, a story that recently came out um, of a paramilitary leader who had uh, recently come out of prison. And um, the, his story was that after they cut off the people's head, they played soccer with the people's heads. Eh, cuando salió de la cárcel, los periodistas le preguntaban, ¿es verdad que ustedes jugaron, jugaron fútbol con la cabeza del señor del Chocó? De, es una región. Usted, es, ¿Es verdad que ustedes jugaron fútbol con la cabeza? Y él respondió, un momento, nosotros sí la cortamos. Nosotros sí cortábamos cabezas, pero no jugábamos fútbol con ellas porque no somos depravados. ¿De qué? Depravados. Oh, okay, so he said, the guy um, was interviewed by journalists who were extremely curious to know if they had indeed, as the urban myth was going around, that they played with the heads of the, of the people who they decapitated, and they, the guy was very um, offended, and he said, well, yes, of course we cut off heads, but we're not deprived enough to have played soccer <laughs> with them. So he admitted that he cut off the heads, but just he didn't go as far as... E ese tipo de, de cosas que están tan en la realidad y que entran dentro de un terreno del absurdo son las que producen risa. No es que la pieza sea una comedia, pero el absurdo de la realidad genera estas risas. Al final del, de la representación era muy común que la gente dijera, sentí culpa por reírme. Mm. Me reí, pero no sé de qué me reí. Ok. That type of level of absurdity that comes out of real situations is what provoked nervous laughter during the piece. And he said, you know, there, there were people that came up to him afterwards and said, I, I laughed, but I feel guilty that I laughed. I don't know why I laughed. Understood. And, and I, I, I just want to ask one more question, which was, did you actually face any particular ramifications Uh, uh, politically or socially because of the production of the play. Sí, la última pregunta es que si hubo ramificaciones políticas en, a ti mismo y a tu compañía por esta obra. Que hubo como, como rechazo. Alguien, sí, rechazo, alguien de, de, trató de censurar. O... No, censura no hubo de ninguna parte. Hubo muchas críticas buenas. Hubo algunos uh, colegas que decían que era una obra de defensa de los paramilitares, otros decían que poníamos al paramilitar demasiado malo, entonces uh, había críticas encontradas. Eh, es, es una obra a, a la que ha ido todo el mundo, el presidente fue a verla, el presidente de la república fue a verla. So, um He said there was no real political ramifications. Um, even the president of the country came to see it. Uh, but it did cause a huge polemic. Some people felt it was too pro-paramilitary. Some people felt <laughs> that it was unrealistically harsh. Um, but, but there was no censorship in, uh, attempted from any given part, including the theater or the government. Um, And uh, so in, at the end of the day, it was, it was a huge step forward in terms of that, having that dialogue on the stages of Colombia. I added that last part. Exactly, it sounds like it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Triggered a very important conversation. Um, Kyung, um, I, you know, you have a very interesting, rela um, well, <laughs> so you are of Korean um, ex um, descent. You uh, grew up in Chile. Um, you moved to the United States, that was a choice. And your work exists at all those intersections. And I know that your play Tala, which I've read and seen, is very much the embodiment of that. But right now what I wanted to ask you about was a project that you embarked on actually using a TCG Global Connections grant to go to Santiago and work with street dancers. Um, uh, and that, I I've been reading about it, it just sounds incredible. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, hi, so um, the project Catherine's speaking about is this project uh, called Que Onda Hamlet. Um, 
I was invited by Centro Cultural Gabriela Mistral in Santiago, Chile to work with them and these group of street dancers that gathered around the theater to dance Korean pop songs. Um, it was a strange phenomenon that started happening in their public plazas about four years ago. And um, they wanted to engage with an artist to work with them. And they said, hey, you're Chilean, Korean. I think you're perfect for this. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> right, no competition. Um, <laughs> So with support of TCG, I went there last December and I work with um, students uh, age 14 to 17 um, for two months. Uh, we had an open call inviting them to participate in this project and for about eight months I did some research as to why this was happening. Um, to give you a little bit of context, GAM is uh, one of the premier arts and cultural institutions in Santiago. It was built in the 1970s by the presidency of Salvador Allende. It was built by the people as a promise of creating a space for the UN to host a development conference, but that after its building that it would be given to the people as a cultural space. During Pinochet's regime, the space was occupied by the military forces and became a military base until the transition back to democracy in which GAM came to become a place for the arts people and, um, and uh, the public. Um, so in this context, um, we looked at to why uh, these students and kids were gathering there. And it turns out that not too far, there's a park called Parque San Borjas, where uh, four years ago, a teenager named Daniel Samudio was murdered by Chilean neo-Nazis. Um, Daniel Samudio was a K-pop dancer who was also gay, and he was killed in a hate crime that led to the first um, legislation protecting gay people against hate crimes in Chile. Um, these kids, gathered in the park to practice their choreographies. They come from the peripheries to the park because it was a central location for most of them, but they did not have access to arts education, to dance classes. Um, they're marginalized, they don't identify with what's available in the Chilean mainstream. So in this world of sort of new technologies and new media, they were identifying with things that were extraneous to Chinese, uh, Chilean, um, the mainstream culture, such as Korean pop. So, um, they came to GAM as a safer space for them to practice. They used the windows of the buildings as mirrors for them to practice their choreographies. And during my time, I sort of placed their stories in this social cultural context to then also ask them about their experiences dancing K-pop and why they were doing it there. Um, it was a challenge uh, to build trust. Um, they were concerned they were going to be censored. I actually had to ask people from GAM to tell them that they were not going to be censored. Um, we had to speak about gender and sexuality. They're in their teenage years and they were exploring their gender and sexuality. Uh, boy bands would form and dance uh, Korean female pop bands. Uh, female bands would form and they would dance Korean male bands. So obviously there was a gender exploration, not necessarily a sexual one. Um, but, um, you know, th there were some basic assumptions that had to be challenged, such as male dancers are gay. That wasn't true in this case. I was probably the only gay person in the room. Um, but there were definitely explorations of gender being done. Um, so I started the interview process. Uh, we worked with institution to create a different way to engage with them with the actual space, trying to get them past you know, the public plazas into the theater, into a rehearsal room, into a dance studio where they could work um, at that capacity for the first time. Um, most of the students learned their choreographies from YouTube videos. Uh, posted online by Korean pop bands. They do this, they're called dance training videos, um, and it's a way for fans to learn uh, the choreographies of these bands. So the kids were really familiar with a dance studio setting because it's where they were learning their choreographies from, but they were always looking at these Korean faces um, and representing and imitating them. So um, as we started conceiving of the project and trying to think as to how we were gonna deliver this to the public, 
um, I had the idea uh, very last minute to basically um, engage with some local filmmakers to taper performances so that we could post them online on YouTube so that they could, in that same medium they're familiar with, see themselves dancing but also see themselves telling their own stories. So um, wow. TCG was very helpful in letting me change my budget. <laughs> we found uh, some local filmmakers to come uh, record um, a very close performance which was actually the first time the kids invited their their parents to come see their work. So it was How also... How did they respond? Um, we had a Q&A and you know it's funny, the kids said we didn't expect anything from this project, we didn't think anything was going to happen. Um, and the parents were very moved and they cried a lot because as we asked the students to tell us about their experiences, they spoke about how the media was severely portraying them as these troubled gay kids who are addicted to drugs and you know sort of partying on the streets irresponsibly when they were out dancing without any financial support. <laughs> raising their own funds to produce their own costumes to provide their own sort of like you know dues to compete um, in these uh, popular um, dance competitions and that they were artists but were not seen as artists mm. and I could totally relate to that um, you know they were sort of very um, entrepreneurial young artists dancing and finding their own ways to rehearse to organize <laughs> um, to uh, commit themselves you know to their projects and to each other to make the work and when they were given a chance to tell their own stories and, and, and speak of their experience through using their own words, um, the, the parents saw a very different side of who their kids were. Um, not the side that was mediated by public television, but you know the kids' stories um, and, and, and their stories from their own point of view. So, so that was really important. And it was also very important for me to extend that safe space, um, not just to the kids, but also for the project. Because, um, you know, teenagers th these days, there's so much bullying happening online. Um, they would come to rehearsals and say, you know, kids know we're doing this, and now they're saying we're really bad dancers and shouldn't be doing it. So we had to protect them from cyberbullying and make sure that the final project would have a safe sort of uh, platform where we could really monitor comments to protect the kids and protect the project um, uh, and, and, and make sure that that, that sort of uh, safety was extended um, uh, throughout the making. Yeah. Thank you. I wish I'd been there. <laughs> well, you can see it online. It's I, on oh, YouTube, I know. I have, I, have, <laughs> I have watched it. I have watched it. Heather, um, you know, we've talked about how moved I am about so much of your work, and uh, but the one piece that I don't know yet is Fallujah, and I would love you to talk about the the way that it was conceived. This is the opera that is going to open at New York City Opera in November, and uh, I I wonder if you could just tell us how it was conceived, uh, what kind of research you did uh, to find out what you needed to know to write that libretto. Yeah, I I would. I would definitely say it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, Except for childbirth. No, it's harder <laughs> than childbirth. Um, because for, for those of you that know me or don't know me, I'm, my dad's Iraqi, and my mom's American, and I was 20 during the first Gulf War, so that's going on 26 years now of Iraq versus America versus, you know. So this completely grew me up and changed the lens through which I viewed myself as an American. Um, and just to put it in context of history and home, when I last saw my uncle in 2006, my Iraqi uncle, I'm like, how are you today, uncle? Oh, Heather, Heather, it's like this and like this and like this because of the Americans, because of the Saddam, because of the English, because of the Ottomans, da, 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 because of <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. <laughs> really, Uncle? It's like that today because of Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, yes, because of Nebuchadnezzar. You know, and this went on for three days in a row. How are you, Uncle? And he wants to tell me this. This is the history, right? Mm. So this is, yes, I'm an American kid from Michigan, but this is, the, this is what I'm carrying. And the idea of home is that I had about 100 family members at the start of this most recent war, and now I have two in Iraq. So when I was asked to write an opera about a Marine 
who served in Fallujah and it was going to be this real life Marine, I thought that's not my job. <laughs> that's not the story I can write. Um, I spent a huge part of my life not being able to humanize anyone in the military. And I knew the only way I could do this was to deeply humanize. So that was, that was the first hurdle. I'd also just given birth to my son. And I'd had a daughter. But the son, I don't know, the son thing was like, they, this one could serve. This one could go to war. How am I going to raise this one, right? So that these are right. Um, and then it was about a real life Marine, so I looked him up online, and, and the story that was sent to me was definitely a hero story, and I let it be known that you're, not, you're definitely not hiring me to do that one. You wouldn't want to. <laughs> that's, that's not what I can deliver. I said, but this is what I learned about this very young man online, is he's had five suicide attempts since coming home. And I said, isn't it a lot harder to come home than to die a hero? And if that's the story you want, you can hire me. And there will be Iraqi characters, and they will be humanized. <laughs> and then, then we were on. Um, and then it was 10 hour a day interviews. I, they, he, they flew him to New York, and he had, he had as much of a guard up about meeting me as I had up about meeting him. But we, we both knew it was going to go well. We just had to, <laughs> we had to go there. Um, so. As he says now, you know, I know more about him than his partner, than anyone in his life. I know all the details um, about his whole life and about his life in Fallujah, which, if any of you know, was pretty much the worst of the worst of the worst fighting for the American military. Um, so that was the story that I had to piece together. What I found along the way for myself was the story was about how do you talk to the people you love after such immense violence. And that was a story that I've been writing my entire life and still continue to write because I'm still asking the question. I'm just tackling that from every angle. Is after that much violence, how do you, how do you love that? Per how do you go back to those kind of conversations, those deeply human conversations? So he and I had to kind of grapple with that together. Um, the story. I created was about a young man returning from war with the five suicide attempts, needing to talk to his, you know, his mom's outside waiting to talk to him and he can't talk to her, can't even face her. Um, it parallels an Iraqi boy and Iraqi mother story. So here I have my son, that I'm, <laughs> my newborn, and it becomes a story about how are these moms and sons ever going to speak about this truth? And another thing I learned along the way was that military, people who had served, especially combat, um, really wanted to talk to me in depth with their whole heart. Um, while I was doing Nine Parts of Desire, I had an inkling to that, but I didn't quite understand the inkling, in that I would get emails from overseas from people serving in Iraq, dying to read my Iraqi woman play because they, they, they wanted to have these, and then they wanted to just correspond with me in depth about who Iraqis were and why, you know. So this, this was not, this was going against the stereotypes. Um, and I had to, I had to dive in. Mm -hmm. um, so I was ready for that. I wanted that. But it was, it was still really hard. It was still really, 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 really hard because I was completely against the war politically. I saw it in the historical context of Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> right? Like that I was carrying, but this and our policy for all that, you know, I was carrying all of that while going, this blip of a mistake is seriously playing out. I mean, it's playing out right now. We're all mm -hmm. in it, right? Mm -hmm. We're all really, really in it. So what happened when you were at Long Beach? So Long Beach was the world premiere. Um, it was awesome. 
It was done, it, it was really beautifully handled by Andreas Mitasek, who is the um, artistic director of Long Beach Opera and the director of the opera. He, his outreach to the military community was extraordinary. It's what we wanted and hoped for, but when somebody's actually enacting it, it's, it's something else. So he, he got the um, armory and the VA and everybody to come on board. He, he, he made it a site-specific work in the armory. It was, um, it was a vast space. It had three entire walls of a Fallujian skyline, which were photographs taken by Marines that were there. Marines, combat Marines, were working with the singers that were playing Marines. I was bringing in my Iraqi friends. You know, we were all tied. The Iraqis were going, and I have PTSD, and you have PTSD. It was this big, you know, conversation. It was very moving. Um, everybody had to stay after and talk about all the things that can't be said, because the opera's about what can't be said. So then, when there's the thing in the room that can't be said, what opera's really good at is singing. <laughs> <laughs> singing it on a scale that can compare to war. Right. Right? So it's, it's like, it's human sound. So it's f from my point of view, human sound in a warscape is something we, we can't <coughs> wrap our heads around. So the only, person that can do that in performance is an opera singer. Make a scale of sound that can encompass that much horror and violence and tragedy in their physical, you know, scale of sound. Um, so I was always pushing for uglier sounds and, you know, mm. opera singers always pushing for beautiful sounds. But anyway, <laughs> aside from that, that's what, what happened in Long Beach was incredible that it even happened at all. One thing I did learn from Long Beach, as I was watching, I learned two things about myself. Well, first I started crying as an American. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, I haven't had any time to grieve as an American. Mm -hmm. I, have had ze I have not even, l I haven't given myself an inch to grieve as an American. I've only been grieving as an Iraqi, right? Like, this is like, this is an American tragedy for me personally. <laughs> I'm going to grieve with these Marines. So that was interesting. The other thing that really hit me, military were, have always embraced it and come out to embrace it and continue to. And there's a, there's a certain thing that's happening, because it, it was written five years ago, mm -hmm. but it only got its world premiere now. And I think the national conversation has shifted. Mm -hmm. Definitely. When even Trump is on TV, even Trump, the war was this really bad thing, this bad idea, it all went wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Suddenly, it's okay for all of us to now be like, the, that, that was the wrong thing, and look at all this intense suffering that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. this is, there are more Marines that kill themselves from suicide than that died, I mean, more, more military personnel that die from suicide than that died in combat. Mm -hmm. So th the military is seriously dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the two things that hit me is, because we're at a theater conference. When we do theater when it's a little safe and it's comfortable in the national conversation and it's being embraced, mm -hmm. versus when we do it when it's not quite, <laughs> right? <coughs> that's just that's something that's on my mind a lot because of the handful of things I've written. They're always kind of happening at the moment it's not safe. Right. And then I'm waiting around for the window mm -hmm. <laughs> when somebody's going to jump in with me. Really interesting. To yes. get on with it, or how far I'm pressing when it's in the, you know. So it's 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 happening to me every single time where I'm coming up against it. This thing was written. This was already written, but now I got to wait two years for you to produce it. Right. Wow. It's right now that it happened for the military that in America. That actually, believe it or not, does segue into the question that I was going to ask Fabio next, which it has to do with this moment in Colombian um, history when uh, there is an opportunity for the country to vote for peace and reconciliation. And there's a great deal of opposition to making that happen. Could you speak briefly about that? Yes, it's a uh, moment es un momento histórico, tal vez mañana se da la noticia de que la paz se, es un hecho. Faltan tres acuerdos y ya se firma eso. So this is indeed a historic moment for my country. Uh, perhaps as soon as tomorrow we might hear that 
a peace agreement has been reached, there's only three more um, like agreements that have to be signed. Eh, pero paradójicamente, eh, una parte de la población dice que la firma de la paz es muy mala. Paradoxically, there is a part of the the citizenship that thinks that signing a peace agreement is bad. No sí. pregunta, ¿por qué? Mm -hmm. ¿Por qué? Hay respuestas varias. Uno dice, mucha gente se va a quedar sin trabajo. Oh my God. So, um, so of course, the first question you would ask yourself is why? Why would you think a peace agreement uh, is bad? And, and some of the people say, oh, well, it'll leave a lot of people unemployed. Um, bueno, y hay otra serie de razones que ya tienen que ver con el castigo, con la venganza, con la justicia. No. Of course, um, many other people fear what the consequences are going to be, what the penalties are going to be, what the, the physical take, mm -hmm, I mean the mm -hmm. psychic take uh, toil is going to be. Um, so there are valid reasons for being afraid. Entonces, cuando hablaba de lo paradójico y de lo controversial de nuestras obras, tiene que ver también con un comportamiento contextual que existe en nuestro país frente a temas tan coyunturales. Yeah, so when I when I talk about why our theater is our brand of theater is so uh, controversial, it has to do with a contextual reality that that really exists in my country. Eh, si se pregunta en nuestro país si está de acuerdo con que maten gente, con que haya masacres o con que haya violencia, todo el mundo va a decir que no. Yeah, if you ask in my country, of course, are you, uh, do you agree with people being massacred, do you agree with people being killed, of course they're going to say no. Pero cuando sucede, en algunos casos, cuando sucede algún asesinato, sobre todo político, mucha gente tiene una frase que es lapidaria para nosotros y es por algo sería. Ah, so, um, but of course, when uh, political motivated, politically motivated death does occur, um, there's a saying in the country, oh, he must have done something. Mm -hmm. hmm. Do you Pero no está de acuerdo con la violencia. But they're not in favor of violence. Would you, would you say that the, you know, the, the, the writing and the production of this play, Labio de Liebre. Um, it, 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 the reason that I thought to ask you the question right then is because of what Heather said, because it feels to me that all three of you are living in that place where you're, you're kind of pushing the issues forward, and in some cases then the play doesn't get produced for a couple of years. In your case, the play is happening right now, and the decision is also happening right now. So you're, as you're putting right out in front of Colombia and the audiences in Colombia, what happened? Right? Pero en algunos casos uno necesita distancia, pero en tu caso lo estás haciendo exactamente cuando esta pregunta del, del, del acuerdo uh -huh. de paz se está considerando. Uh -huh. y, y, ¿Y cuál ha sido la, el resultado? Eh, cuando hemos tenido funciones ante víctimas, por ejemplo, las reacciones han sido muy emocionales. Pues eh, antes y después de la obra tenemos conversaciones y pues salimos afectados ellos y nosotros afectados en, de, de una manera muy buena. Eh, ha, ha habido una respuesta que, su, que nos ha sucedido en tres casos, nos sucedió en México, en Medellín, Colo en México, en Medellín, en Guanajuato, México, en Medellín, Colombia y en Valledupar, que fue una zona que fue azotada por la violencia. Eh, había una, una declaración que decía... Eso, eso que ustedes cuentan nos pasó a nosotros. Y siempre lo había recordado con dolor. Ahora lo puedo recordar así como ustedes me lo mostraron. So, um, you, you talked too, too long, so let me try to put pieces together. So, um, 
the thing that's amazing about showing this work, especially uh, to people who have been victimized by violence, either themselves or family members or, or loved ones, um, we always have a, um, a discussion with the audience before and after the play to really deal with some of these issues. And um, we, as a company, always comes out very um, engaged but traumatized at the same time. Interestingly, when we went to Guanajuato, Mexico, Medellin, Colombia, and Valle... Valle de Upar. Valle de Upar. Valle de Upar. Um, they, all the audiences said, this is our story as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And just having them um, embrace the story and, and put it in their own context mm -hmm. means that the story has a meaning beyond the immediate um, Bogota context. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I'm reminded of uh, several years ago, um, this t comes to your work, uh, Kyung, um, that I was working with the Belarus Free Theater and they made a really beautiful piece which played in this very space called Discover Love. And uh, it was uh, about, a t it was uh, based on a real situation in which a friend of uh, the company uh, had uh, disappeared suddenly one night and his body was found months later. So these forced disappearances that also took place in Chile. And I was with uh, a friend of mine who's a theater director in Santiago, and uh, he saw the piece uh, in New York, and um, he wanted to bring it to Chile because he felt that telling the story of forced disappearances in Belarus would resonate with the Chilean audience without their having to feel that the story was about their country and them. Do you want to say anything about that, especially with regard to uh, how somehow the dictatorship and the shift in power has had such an impact on your work? Mm. Yeah. So um, growing up, um, we knew that there was a military coup on September 11th, 1973, but my history textbooks ended on that day. So um, in the late 80s, there was no history about the 70s. And for a very long time, there's been a collective amnesia as to what happened in Chile since the regime. I think with the transition to democracy, stories are being told. We are regaining our memory. Museums are being built to gather these stories so they're not forgotten. But there isn't a real truth and reconciliation in the country. And uh, that manifests itself in different levels of sort of social turmoil. Um, I think uh, in that sense, uh, understanding history has been a very important part of my work. Um, coming of age as a playwright in New York, witnessing 9-11, um, it was more than just uh, a kind of awakening, but also a kind of responsibility to ask myself to try to bring these disparate histories that I have inherited and to find the connections between them. Um, if you look back, um, you know, my parents lost their country because of an ideological war that separated Korea into North and South Korea. And there's no peace in Korea. It's just a ceasefire until today. Um, mm -hmm. Under dictatorships, um, my parents grew up and raised me to, um, in Chile with the hope that I would live a freer life and I witness a transition to democracy, America being my bastion of democracy in the world, and my life here is not as free as one would think it is. And there's a part of me that believes that unless there is peace um, and freedom outside America, my life here in America will not be peaceful or free either. Um, so that's why the work I make is to promote a culture of peace and nonviolence and to affect change here, seeking change out there in the world. Um, I think to be more specific to Tala, which was a piece we produced last January, um, you know, Chile has a very changing understanding of its own history. And as we're developing Tala, I was telling my autobiographical story and mixed it with the story of Pepe and Lupe, two Chilean lovers going out on this really bad date on the night before September 11th. And their dialogue was based on the correspondence of Neruda and Mistral, um, two Chilean Nobel laureates and poets. Um, Neruda was exhumed three years ago. 
uh, after decades after his death, there are still suspicions as the causes of his death. Mistra's identity as a gay woman who lived in Long Island in a lesbian domestic relationship with Doris Dana, um, a former employee of the US State Department, was only unveiled a few years ago. So through our shifting understanding of our own history and literary figures, I've been trying to explore how our understanding of history can evolve and is not fixed, and <laughs> what role we may play as storytellers and truth seekers um, to question our own history. Um, yeah. Thank you, Kyung. You know, um, we, we don't have that much time left, and I do want to open things up to you all in case you have questions in just a moment. But Heather, would you read a little bit? Would you do that? I, oh, <laughs> um, I had asked Heather to read just a short excerpt from her play, Nora, which is a, um, a reimagining of a doll's house. Um, if you don't mind contextualizing that, and just read a short piece. Um, it's an Iraqi immigrant family, um, and the, if you imagine a doll's house as a marriage under massive cultural pressure, um, I imagine this cultural pressure being both the pressure of being Iraqi and the pressure of trying to assimilate into America. Um, and this family happens to be from Mosul, which is where ISIS is dominated, which is where my family originated from. So a lot of a lot of what this particular Nora is, is, is try, she's trying to hold a lot of things. And I think that the one thing I think about is that door slam and where that door slam is reverberating around the world right now for me is with refugees mm -hmm. leaving. It's the leaving of home. Um, and yep. I'm not holding on anymore. I worked so long to get her back, to go home. Iraq is not home anymore. With little I carry from as far back as Babylon, I've already given to Yazin, to Mariam, to our grandchild, my blood. That's all that's left. The rest is gone. Gone. Millions and millions of people flooding out with nothing, leaving behind the beginning of time leaving houses and libraries and languages older than Aramaic. No wonder so many of us are drowning. The responsibility is impossible to bear. It's the weight of being erased, of not belonging anymore. Thank you. Okay, um, I wonder if anyone has questions for the panelists that you could ask now because the microphones are available. Yes? Yes, sir. Um, uh, Stephen Stern, Mosaic Theater. Um, hearing all of you, very moved, and seeing history and home above you, uh, in a panel earlier today, um, we heard a, f a formulation that um, maybe my theater uh, does not give answers, but it asks the good questions. Mm. Um, there is such a, um, a cacophony and a swirl in the end that you guys are all working in, asking questions and answers about history and and home, I, I, and I've heard some of you even speak directly to your asking questions of history or asking questions of how you build a home that it's lost. I, I, I just would like to hear further reflections on the swirl that is at the center of the theatricalization of the central theme of this panel from any of you. I'll, I'll dive in because I, I just, I, I realized something today about myself too is this, um, identity and belonging, and where I thought I was in pursuit of identity in my work for decades, I've now thrown it out the window, mm. um, and belonging is, any, is everything. So <laughs> it's kind of back to my uncle with this Nebuchadnezzar, and that's the history and that's the identity. Um, but what I think I'm really after is where is this belonging? Because belonging is like the home. 
And if you end up having to leave the place where you called home, where Nebuchadnezzar was for thousands of years, right, that thousands of years home, can you still belong somewhere? How do we belong? I mean, I think about that as just myself. I'm still looking for belonging. Mm-hmm. I was just, in the research for this play, there's this crazy thing that came up because I'm Christian, Iraqi Christian. Well, you know, Iraqi Christians aren't Arabs. And I was like, oh, I don't know. Like, I, don't like, I just don't know anymore. Like, what are you going to do? Take my DNA? I don't know. Like, it's just, to, just all these. And then there's this whole part of the community going, but we're not. And then the one's going, but we are. And I don't know about identity. Like, I, that's what I mean. I threw it out the window. I literally threw it out the window because all the work I've been doing with Middle Eastern women in, in New York and in the Middle East, it's, it's really about belonging. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, who, who cares what our identity, I mean, of course, we care what our identity is, but you know, like, we find that place that feels, but we belong, gosh, that feels good. And it can be anywhere and in any way. Mm-hmm. But I'm in pursuit of that. All my characters are in pursuit of that. And it's really hard to find. It's kind of my son's cheek. Oh, yeah. That, like, that's the closest thing I can, just that smell of that, that part is like that, okay, that's belonging versus I don't care where I am or what somebody said I was from, right? Did you want to say something? Sure. Young? Yeah. Um, so I think f- for myself, it's been very hard to navigate um, the the American theater world just because um, I, I I live in the intersections of many different identities, so it's very hard f- for anyone to peg me as one thing, and I do not um, easily uh, adjust to that kind of pegging anyway. Um, so in my work, it's it's been about how to create work that uh, is inclusive and inviting for the very different communities that uh, my work engages with and speaks to. And it's been very hard because as an immigrant, um, I've not had a lot of access uh, to opportunities to share my story. Um, That is why I created my own theater company. And now that we are making our own work, it's how to find a home for not just my work, but the community that we have built. Um, and is engaging with the work. I, I do have to say that when I look at that, I, I, I understand where the question comes from, but I, I have to be quite honest. Um, I'm very excited to be here, but the American theater in the end was not my home. I had to build my home. Um, and I think that in that sense, uh, I am trying to create a new home, and where I'm looking at is the streets, uh, because the institutions were not where I was supported. Um, you know, as an except art- by TCG, except by TCG. But you know, I, I just, I, I just want to say, like, you know, um, like, like there was a very long time of struggle. You know, as an immigrant, I jumped through many different hoops for 16 years. Um, and it wasn't my artistic excellence or my great employ- employable skills that uh, kept me in this country. It was the miracle of gay marriage and the fact that I had fallen in love and was ready to be married and get a green card through a huge social change that had nothing to do with me as an artist, as a writer, or as anything except it was a very powerful social transformation that enabled this. So, um, you know, th- th- these weren't, these changes that, that I am conscious of um, <laughs> and are empowering me to stand here and speak to you today um, are, are sometimes not even artistic, <coughs> you know? Uh, yeah. Thanks, Kyung. Yeah. Were there any other questions? Uh, Oh, did you? Um, oh, please, por favor. Yes. Sí. <laughs> I have two answer uh, in dramat in dramatic terms. Uh, dramatic uh, as a play writer, no as a soap opera. Mm. <laughs> uh, eh, eh, si una, eh, te, supongamos una familia, un hogar. Uh, la mamá descubre que su hija de 15 años abortó. Y le dice, con eso que usted acaba de hacer, destruyó mi hogar. 
Yeah. So I have to uh, respond in dramatic terms. This is imagine a family where uh, a young 15-year-old girl finds herself uh, pregnant and aborts, and her mother finds out and says to the young woman, with this you have destroyed our home. La niña le dice, es de mi papá. And she responds, but it's my father's child. La mamá le dice, no le vaya a contar eso a nadie porque va a destruir esta familia. And the mother says, do not tell this story to anyone because it will destroy this family. <laughs> eh, ese hogar es el resultado de, la, de una historia, de la historia de un país y de una fractura social que viene durante muchos años. That story comes from a social fracture that has been in development for many years. En esa medida, ¿quiénes son los buenos? ¿Quiénes son los malos? Mm, creo que habría que acudir a la historia antes que al momento coyuntural de este hogar. So, um, if you want to really dissect this story, because in such a story there are no good and evil people, I disagree with you. Uh, <laughs> um, you have to really look at the historical antecedents, not just that particular family. And in dramatic terms. <laughs> Good. Who, who else had a question? Mm -hmm. Yes. <coughs> Hi, I'm Lisa Mount with Artistic Logistics. Um, so. This conversation among you all reminds me of a quote by the late Joe Carson, who wrote 36 plays from people's actual experiences, um, who often said, never ruin a good story by sticking to the facts. But in this moment of changing relationship to history, I'm really interested in your dramatic processes, in your artistic relationship to facts, and how to convey facts, which we've been dealing with kind of all day, about the histories from which you come, and how do you grapple with that artistically to make them engaging, to make them real, and not just a recitation of statistics? I think what you're saying is something that um, uh, uh, Teresa and I were talking about yesterday, which is finding that balance between artistic and social responsibility. Who, anybody wanna? Were you pointing at the, every, uh, anybody? They have nothing to say. All I only sudden, feel artistic responsibility. I mean, I, I do my research, so I know what the facts are. But when it comes to writing, it's art. It's art. It has to be good. It has to be full. It has to come out of me like a piece of art. Like I, I don't, I don't, I, I throw responsibility out the window. Like the, the research, I guess I feel responsibility in the research to know exactly what the facts are, to know them better than anyone else around, or, you know? But, but if I'm creating art, it's artistic responsibility. But I suppose it is possible to be socially responsible without being uh, tied to facts. Sure. Yeah. You know? Yes. Um, I, I, I come from a, a, a research-based process, especially when I realized that my work was becoming political. I wanted to be more responsible because the reviews to my work were that I was being irresponsible. So, <laughs> so I kind of uh, develop research skills and I really investigate history. But I feel when we're engaging with contemporary history and what's happening right now, it's very hard to know what is happening right now. There isn't a kind of uh, true, uh, a sort of accounted for, uh, uh, like a uh, knowledge base to understand the present moment. I think we're all trying our best to understand the present moment. So I think to a certain extent I do research, but I give myself the artistic freedom to take that research to understand the context in which we're asking questions. And my process is really based on questions and artistic intents and personal goals for the artists involved. Um, when we gather, I ask the artist, what are your goals? My goal with my previous show was to immigrate to America and how do you get a green card from writing a play? I don't know, but it worked in four years. Um, you know, so it's 
it's, yeah. it's, you know, there isn't a kind of scientific accuracy to what it is we do, but there is a way to specify intentions and goals and to create theater with those intentions and goals in mind. And I feel like the work that we are doing always reveals something, but I feel like when it's wonderful, it's when it reveals something about the future. So when we are stuck two years behind, it's because we knew it two years before, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Did you want to say anything? En, en el, uh, cuando, cuando tengo un material, cuando tengo un material, sí hay una responsabilidad, pero entonces la pregunta es, esta es responsabilidad periodística, documental, terapéutica, estética. Mm. When he has um, his hands on particular material, one of the thought processes he goes through is this reportage, is this really um, a, a documentary process, or is it an aesthetic process f through which I want to tell the story? Eh, entonces, tengo que tomar una decisión. Y en nuestro caso, nosotros le damos a los personajes las mismas garantías. A todos los personajes que están, les damos las mismas garantías. Incluso a los personajes que odiamos y con los que no estamos de acuerdo. Uh, yeah, so in our process, we uh, give each character a guarantee, uh, even the ones that we don't agree with or that are the antithesis of our belief systems. Sí, porque, porque no sería valiente eh, no darle las mismas garantías a un enemigo. O sea, es como, como tener un enemigo en desventaja. Si yo tengo en el escenario un personaje que yo odio, tengo que darle las mismas garantías del personaje que yo quiero. Porque si no, no sería justo. Y no sería equilibradamente dramático. And we feel strongly that we have to give the same tools and the same guarantees, as he puts it, um, so that even the characters that are antithetical to our beliefs are armed with just as many, um, as much ammunition as the ones that we care deeply about. Otherwise, it wouldn't be just and it wouldn't um, give uh, a well-developed uh, result. Yeah, see. One more question, if anybody has one. Yes. Hi, I'm Annabelle Guevara from uh, Theater Communications <coughs> Group. Um, first, I just wanted to have a shout out for Olga Garay, English holding it down over there. Thank you so much, <laughs> <laughs> so good. Um, but I do have a question for Fabio, so. Um, um, just in the context, he was talking about touring the show to different cities in Mexico, mm -hmm. and although he said that they didn't encounter um, in Colombia as much, you know, as the, con the piece was controversial, that, there, that it would be problematic to present. Um, in Mexico, where it's a country where a lot of, you know, artists and journalism, journalists um, are killed for speaking out against the cartel, um, I just wonder if there was any, you know, precaution or any, you know, advice or any, just when you, before you went to Mexico, of, of anybody that you were collaborating with there that was nervous, um, because mm -hmm. it is, you know, it's very real. Chekhov, 
y uno siente que están hablando de uno, uno lee Dostoyevsky y uno siente una identificación. No quiero decir que un sea uno como ellos, pero ojalá algún día se logre ser <laughs> universal. So he says, in his, um, from his belief, the more particular you make a story, the more universal that it gets. And what their experience has been is that, you know, they've presented this, this piece and people from Israel and Peru and Mexico have been in the audience and afterwards they come to them and, and somehow they have absorbed the, the story and, and they can relate to it from their own perspective. And he says, it's the same as when we see um, a, a tale from Chekhov or Dostoevsky or the mask, Master and, Mar, and Margarita, you know, that, that you are able to process that story according to what your um, psychological and emotional experiences have been in life. So, you know, hopefully that's the, the power that, that art has. Um. I hope that you will take the opportunity over dinner to continue talking with these amazing <laughs> people. Um, I think we're going to call it a day for this panel. Um, thank you for your kind attention, and thank you to all of you. I'm very moved to hear from everyone. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our um, Catherine and our History and Home panelists. Thank you to Sanja and our race, colonization, and art panelists. Um, we're wrapping up this part of our day. Uh, I want to send another shout out to someone who's been really instrumental to the organization of this day, and that's Kevin Bitterman. Uh, and to, to say, just like, don't think about hiring JoJo away from <laughs> the lab. Don't think about hiring Kevin away from DCG. Um, so, what we're going to do, I just want to mention, in addition to, I think, both of the panels we've heard today um, and participated in, uh, we feel this sense of this is a conversation that wants to keep happening and it needs some structure for that. So I know we're going to be thinking a lot um, at the Global Theater Initiative about how to make that happen going forward. But there are also a number of opportunities to continue talking about international work, um, uh, cultural exchange, cultural policy. Uh, in the conference going forward. And we're also very excited, if you haven't seen the schedule yet, that we're closing the conference on Saturday with a plenary session that will include the UN Ambassador Samantha Power and Kwame Kweyarma from Center Stage and Oscar Eustace from the Public Theater. So that's going to be a, a really rich conversation about theater and the arts and cultural uh, exchange and cultural diplomacy. So looking forward to that. And now I'm going to hand it over to the wonderful Jojo to talk about uh, the performance that we're going to see in a few minutes. Thank you. So um, we're about to go into a 20-minute break. Um, and then we're going to go on our site-specific journey, McGrar, um, which is going to start promptly at 5 o'clock. So I'm leaving it up to you all to be prompt about that. Um, and so uh, we're thrilled to welcome Adrian, the artistic director of Kamchaka, which is a street theater company based in Barcelona that has a long history of experimenting and investigating art in public spaces, particularly around the theme of immigration. So it felt very apt for this to be our our evening performance. Um, Adrian arrived here four days ago and has been working with a group of 14 multi-generational citizens um, since Sunday in preparation for today's street outing. Um, we're really grateful for the Institute Ramon Lol for helping support this short residency. Um, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to take our 20-minute break and then at right at 5 o'clock we're going to actually meet outside of the Davis Performing Arts Center. And so that is where the journey will start. This is a walk walking journey, and we encourage you to embrace the adventure and to go where the journey takes you. So keep that in mind as you uh, <laughs> follow people throughout all over campus and poten potentially around the streets as well. Um, so then immediately following McGrar, we're going to have dinner in the lobby here at the Davis Performing Arts Center before we have our culminating event of the day, which starts right at 7.30. So you must wear this badge if you would like to receive dinner and get back in here. We have a number of people who are joining us for McGrar and for prevented performances. So please make sure to keep on your badge so you can get enough food and come back in. Um, so 
and then if anybody has mobility issues, come talk to us at the check-in table and we can sort of sort some of those things out. But we'll see you outside at five. <laughs>